Hello, everybody. Welcome to Trader Brown Show for your Thursday afternoon edition. I had a, a great day today. I actually had the opportunity to, to teach with Larry Jacobson. He's doing a course over at UCI dealing with um, leadership and kind of the understanding the roles of leadership, how to be a good leader. And I got to give a nice little session out there today. So thank you, Larry, and for the UCI students for enduring a live Merlin Rothfeld presentation. Um, you guys may have seen the topic for today's show. I, I decided to do this based off a listener question. It just says, economic hurricane dead ahead with a big question mark. If you notice, uh, I always try to encourage you to send me topics through the YouTube channel. You can do that by commenting on pretty much any YouTube video, and I copy those out, put them through PowerPoint, and then a lot of times that ends up guiding the program, which in fact it did today because this was a comment that came through at uh, my email, which is tradermerlin at gmail.com. And it was Tammy says, please comment on Jamie Diamond's comments about an economic hurricane ahead. And I thought, you know what? Let's do that. Why not? Um, as you guys obviously know, I've been very vocal about the – the potential for an economic collapse basically based off of just domino effect where one small piece of economic data impacts another which impacts another and then it circles back around and now it's a bigger dent to the economic data so i thought we'd talk about uh jamie diamond's comments which is uh, there's an economic hurricane coming up ahead and I'll, I'll ask you guys through polls here a little bit what you guys think about that one but he's not the only individual out there of course as you know jamie diamond's very outspoken about these financial markets and um i'm not a huge fan of his personally but hey you know he's got a platform and he's got millions of followers so i'm sure he can sway the markets now uh, goldman sachs's john waldron also came out and said hey listen I think we're headed for a very ugly ride ahead of us. And that starts to beg the question, are they too little too late or do they really see some riding on the wall? Now, let me offer my two cents before I go and dive into these charts here. If you look at the way financial firms operate, as the markets are rallying up and making all-time highs, what they're doing is they're issuing upgrades. So they'll issue an upgrade on a stock and say, you should be buying this one, you should be buying this one. Why? multiple reasons, but one of the big reasons is they don't want to look stupid by not issuing an upgrade uh, alert during bullish times. So now let's flip the script here. Right now we have a market situation where the equity markets have been selling off. Granted, we've had some um, bear market rallies, but overall it's been selling off. For a, a, a large financial firm to not be saying something bearish about this market makes them look somewhat ignorant. So I think it's it's commonplace for firms like JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs, which are the two that have come out, to say rather bearish comments. Why? Well, look at the price charts. When we look at the price charts here that have happened recently, this is, obviously, everybody here knows it, but going back into December of 2020, actually November uh, of 2021, We've been down quite a bit. So to not make a bearish comment when the markets, uh, in this case, I'm looking at the NASDAQ, has fallen off of its peak about... Uh, 31%, you look kind of stupid if you don't start issuing bearish comments out there. So I think a lot of what you're going to hear from Jamie Dimon and uh, John Waldron and anybody else who might be of a prominent financial firm, they're going to be making bearish comments. Now, does that mean that all of a sudden we're going to start to bounce up, right? Do the opposite of what they're telling you to do? It, it could very well be. And maybe that's part of the reason why we saw this this jump today, as Joe says, we've got a week of bad economic data and the S&P rips up. The market works in mysterious ways. Yeah, the market works sometimes in inverse ways, right? It, my mentor said the markets do what least people expect it to do. It'll, it'll, it starts in one direction with as few people on board as possible, right? So as that market was making all-time highs and people are claiming for um, even higher highs, Everybody was already long, so nobody was expecting it to drop. Well, a few were expecting it to drop, but there were a few people in the short camp at that moment. Now, I think you have a lot of people in that short camp, which is why I kind of believe you're going to have a, a more pronounced bull or bear market rally here to the upside before continuing on down. You need to shake some of those bears out, get them off the boat, and then once they jump ship and we know we now realize that more people are buying long – then the institutions will take this thing back down. So, you know, this price chart to me is is just very indicative of those types of comments coming out from the major firms. It is a, um, to me, as, as Margaret says there, a little late for Diamond's comment. I agree. I, I think that it's late to the party. And, you know, one of the things that I like to do, and, and this really helped me learn the truth behind the proverbial Wizard of Oz financial markets, is I would follow every single day the upgrades and downgrades. So let me see if I can just bring that up for you here real quick. Uh, upgrades and downgrades today. All right, so I'm just going out to a random uh, website here. This is from MarketWatch. I'll click on upgrades and downgrades. And 
I look for the big ones here. See, here we've got, um, that's not JP Morgan, that's JMP, but here we got Citigroup, right? That's a pretty big name. You also have, uh, there's some Barclay, here's some Wells Fargo. So what I would normally do is I would, I know it's really small, let me bump that up for you guys. There you go. Um, what I would normally do is I would scan for the really big names, like your JP Morgans, your Deutsche Bank right here. It's got a few. Uh, Goldman was always my favorite target. Here's Morgan Stanley, right? So Morgan Stanley today, maintained, means stay the same for Walgreens. So let's go look and see if I can sort this by upgrades and downgrades. Uh, assumes. All right, so here's, here's a good one. <laughs> um, Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs right here said downgrade of Starry Group, S-T-R-Y. Now, Goldman Sachs, for whatever reason, has some information which they feel would indicate that this might be going even lower, right? That's what the general belief here is. That's why they're telling you to, they're downgrading it. So let's go S-T-R-Y. Oh, wow. Okay, this is an anomaly. This was not the example I was looking for at all. Uh, I would normally not touch these. Normally when you see them downgrade something, it's already sold off 20, 30, 40, 50%. So let me find another one here. That was a bad example. Let's go to uh, Wells Fargo, downgraded CCI, Crown Castle International. All right, so let's go to CCI. This, this actually doesn't look that bad. I mean, if you look at this, <laughs> thanks KF, smash that like button, of course. Um, that's right, Tom. I was over at UCI, home of the Mighty Ant Eaters. Probably one of the weirdest um, school mascots. I think the only one weirder would be, what's it, UC Santa Cruz Banana Slugs or something like that? <laughs> the Banana Slugs? Um, yeah, it's always great. It's the second time I've actually been over there. Um, you like Kramer better than Diamond? Oof. That, oh, my, oh, man. You really put me on the spot with that one. That is a tough one, Lisa. It, I don't, I don't, I don't have like an overt hatred for either of them. I just look at them for what they are. They're getting paid, especially Jamie Dimon. Like Jamie Dimon's being paid an ungodly amount of money to steer the ship over there at J.P. Morgan. And I believe that his interests are very self-interested. If you look at somebody like a Jim Cramer, he gives the, pers the impression that he's out there to help you. Right, he's out there to help the average American make money, and I and I think that that's actually worse because he is so unbelievably wrong on a lot of his calls, and most of the calls, the reason they work is because he has so many people following him. So I would actually say I like Jamie Dimon more because he's not hiding anything. He doesn't care about the little guy. He's there to make money for himself and for his firm. So I know Lisa. I like it. I like when you joke with me. I'm I'm, I'm good with that. So I, I would have to say I would prefer Jamie Dimon over Wow, Ron. You're going to make me go out and buy a brand new bottle of whiskey, especially like the one you had up in Vegas. Uh, I forget what the name of that one was, but thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Joe says, Jamie Dimon being bullish on Bitcoin worries me. Look, I actually use this in part of my presentations for Online Trading Academy. I have a list of all the Jamie Dimon quotes about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. It's nothing but negative, negative, negative. It's a scam. It's a fraud. It's a joke. It's a scam. I don't use it. It means nothing to me. And then all of a sudden... JP Morgan starts their own cryptocurrency. So take that for what it's worth. Uh, but yes, thanks, Ron. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. I'm going to have to you give me the name of the bottle and I'll go buy that one specifically because I really wanted to bring that one back with me. <clears throat> okay. So back to our, our discussion here. Again, you have to take everything that a financial firm says with a grain of salt. Just like I'm sure in your personal life, you have friends tell you certain things and you got to go, okay, I'll take that as uh, you know high level recommendation. But I'm going to do my due diligence, right? Uh, if I look at Crown Castle, l let me ask you this one. If you looked at Crown Castle, would you say this one is performing better or worse than the overall market right now? All right, look, just look at the price chart here. This is a, a daily going back into, uh, let me get that out of the way, daily chart going back into October of 2020. Does this look better or worse than, let's say, the S&P 500? So they're issuing a downgrade on it, which I can understand because the overall markets are going down. But this thing looks better. This looks better. Here's the S&P 500, which is clearly rolling over lower lows, lower highs. Here's your NASDAQ, clearly rolling over lower lows, lower highs. But CCI actually looking somewhat stable. Granted, a lot of choppy action here. So I, you know, I'm kind of raising an eyebrow as to why you're telling me to get out of one that's overperforming the market. Uh, any other good ones here? Let me see if I can find a couple more downgrades. Or we can do upgrades as well. Um... Wells Fargo did SJW. Let's check out SJW. SJW. 
Um, so this one's gone from roughly $74 down to 62. I could understand them issuing a downgrade here, but you know, for me, if we put the weight on these financial firms and believe that they have the, the, the prowess, if you will, or the understanding of financial markets, they should be able to issue a downgrade as things are moving up and realizing that it's going to turn. Unfortunately, continue to, um, <laughs> continue to raise their targets during bullish markets. And then once it starts to crash, I mean, we're down 30% on some of these markets and they're now issuing more downgrades. Let me see if we can find anything that says upgrades here on this one, just for fun. Uh, let me scroll down here. There's maintains, probably not a lot of upgrades going on, but you might find a couple. Here's a couple from um, UBS, ECL and X-Ray. Let's check out ECL. All right, so my, my, my guess here is that UBS has a big holding in Ecolab, so they're issuing an upgrade, like basically saying, please buy this stock because we have a bunch of it. And you remember, one of the ways I showed you to go look for that um, is to go out here and, uh, what, what did we say a ticker symbol was? ECL. You can go to something like Yahoo Finance and type in the ticker symbols, and you'll be able to see holders. And quite frequently, you can scroll down, and you can actually see the name of the big firms that are holding. So here I don't see any UBS, which is unfortunate. Uh, but my guess is they probably do have some exposure to large positions of the security. And what was that second one? Second one was uh, X-Ray. X-R-A-Y. Oh, there's another one. This thing was up at 70. Now it's down at 41. So they most likely are in a world of hurt right now. So there you go. Um, <laughs> issue an upgrade. Try to get people to buy it so we can offload our shares at a higher price. Always. Always look at the price chart and make your own decision before you uh, jump on what some institution says. And notice today a nice 7% up move based off of that announcement. This is actually probably a great time to sell because UBS issues an upgrade. It rallies right back up into this area of supply. Now, granted, it's kind of tough for a lot of people to pull the trigger and uh, go short after someone issues an upgrade. But you're coming right in that area of supply, hit it perfectly today. My guess is you might actually get a chance to fill this gap, but uh, the trend is your friend. Probably going to keep on drifting down. Uh, Merlin, good from Nigeria. Good to see you, Obioma. Um, which time frame best shows uh, the PA direction of the in instructions that they prefer to mislead the retail trades? Well, I, it's not that there's necessarily a better time frame. I personally like to look at the daily time frame because it gives me an idea of what happened every single day. And I, I live my life every single day. I don't necessarily live my life five minutes at a time. So... I, I prefer to start with the daily time frame. I think that's the easiest one to look at. It's the cleanest. You get a census to gap so you can see the emotion. Whereas sometimes if you do a weekly or a monthly, you won't really see the gaps specifically every night. Maybe you'll see them over the weekend. So I prefer to start with the daily. As you guys know, most, as you've seen, most of my um, charts here are looking at the daily time frame to start. And then I'll whittle down from there. Um, it, it's, I think you just have to take a step back and look at a price chart. So when I when I went to upgrades and downgrades and was kind of scrolling through some of these, you know, just because Oppenheimer issued an upgrade on Wolf Speed, you would think that they're saying, hey, this is a better company. But remember, why are they issuing that upgrade? It quite very well could be that they are losing money on their position and they have to create buyers. So here's Wolf. Again, another one that's down significantly, almost 50% since the highs in November. You got to create buyers, right? There is a great video, which I would try to play for you now, but what I, I don't want to get a warning from um, from YouTube. They can block my channel if I play this video. But it's a Saturday Night Live. Um, I forgot the exact name of it. But basically, there's an actor out there, and he's supposed to be representing a financial firm. And it's a shareholder meeting, right? And so there's this room full of people, and he's like, telling about how his positions and he says, oh, you know, going into 9-11, uh, we got completely out of our portfolio and had no positions long or open uh, when 9-11 happened and actually made money on the downside. And one of the people in the audience says, excuse me, you, you got completely out of stocks in, in, 9, in, in 2001? Well, why? You were telling us to buy. I think the guy goes, well, I mean, that's, that's obvious. If, if you need to unload shares and get out of a position, you have to convince somebody out there to buy it. It's just common sense. So anytime you hear, even me, I mean, honestly, but I'll be honest, I'll tell you, hey, I'm buying it for this reason, this reason, this reason, and I think it's going to go in a specific direction. So I think I'm a little more transparent than most. Uh, but if you look at if you look at these ones right here, you could probably go and look in behind the scenes here, and they'll issue a press release 
um, an upgrade. Let's see, you can probably issue, maybe they even put a, a, a report out. A lot of times they'll issue a report. Let's see if I can find some news here on this one. Uh, no, uh, I thought there might be some more news, but um, here you go. There's your headline. Unfortunately, it's not letting me click on an article, so there's no article attached to this, uh, apparently. But um, quite often, they're just trying to manipulate it. So just be, <laughs> recreate it, call it a parody. I could do that. I need actors. I need to have somebody in there to do it with me. Uh, it would be fun to redo that one. It was actually brilliant. It was brilliant. Well, well, well done. Exactly, Lisa. Someone has to manipulate the stock. So Obioma, I think uh, you know the overall message which I've said here repeatedly, not just today but over the years, has been I think you need to approach the financial markets from this angle. Every single person other than myself is against me. That's the way I look at it, right? Uh, only person that cares about my money is me. Anybody else is against me and potentially my enemy in this endeavor. Now, of course, you know all of you. I would say you're you're kind of my teammates. You're not. None of you here are my enemies because we're all small fish. I don't expect you guys to be taking my lunch. But Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan and Merrill Lynch, I would call those my enemies. However, making uh, uh, understanding their actions and how they manipulate people now makes them your friend. Because if you understand their tricks and you understand how they use, issue upgrades and downgrades, you know you can capitalize on them. A lot of people look at this these announcements I just showed you. And they'll hang their hat on him like, oh, Oppenheimer upgraded Wolf today. I'm just going to buy some. Or when Jim Cramer says, buy, 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 they go ahead and buy it. And usually it just goes down over the next couple of days. So I think it's uh, it's important to, to approach it like any piece of news is bad news. Uh, I showed it to you the other day. Uh, number three on my 10 laws of trading is ignore the news, but listen to every word of it. Well, I consider upgrades and downgrades ignoring the, use, uh, ignoring the news. Um, I Take care of your lunch money. If, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't really eat a lot of lunch, but <clears throat> I know you care about me, Laurie. That's why I appreciate it. Uh, that's why I love doing the show. OTA's Facebook group posted that Saturday Live video about two weeks ago. Yeah, uh, it's pretty good. I, I can post it on Facebook or YouTube, but what happens is if I do, if I play videos here on this channel, I can get copyright infringement tags and they'll freeze my channel. So I just not going to risk it. I've had some great videos over the years I wanted to play, but uh, I can't because... I actually, um, the other day when I couldn't run a show because my I was sick, I actually played a video, but they pulled it down because I put um, a song in the background and they, they flagged me on that one. <laughs> Terrible. Um, all right, let me go to, so that's that's the, the, the gist of those comments from Jamie Dimon, right? The initial question was, uh, please comment on Jamie Dimon's comments about an economic hurricane ahead, which I, I have to ask the question. And you can just type in simple, uh, you know what, let's do a poll. Why not? Um, and I'm going to do this for the next, let's just say, in the six months. In the next six months, uh, is the economy going to get better or worse? Uh, so I'm sorry, it's got to type this as I do it. As the east. Now, they didn't really say a time frame. Um, for this, but I just put in the poll, so everybody, we got you know eighty something people here. Just, just click this one. What, just what do you think? There is no right or wrong answer. I'm just curious what you all think. In the next six months, is the economy going to be getting better or is it going to be getting worse? And that, I guess, lays into this economic hurricane. So while we uh, wait for the polls and you guys to click that one real quick in the in the chat, um, I want to show you. Let, let's run through some of the economic data. So I'm going to go back one month, right? So obviously I'm not going to use this week. We'll use one month. Uh, when do Wall Street's wealthiest clients get this news? A lot of times they're in way before us. Way before us. Yes, it's a yes or no poll. Um, what is yes, better or worse? So, oh, what, what was my question? In the next six months, is the economy going... Oh. <laughs> oh, you're right. I, can I edit this poll? I'm an idiot. Sorry. Let me, uh, let me do this. You're right. Thank you, guys. I'm going to end that poll and redo it. That was just stupid of me. Gosh, you guys are just too good. So I'll put another poll, and I will say, in the next six months, is the economy going to is the economy going to get better? All right, that there you go. Oh uh, yeah, my apologies. And I will put a question mark right there. And now we can do it, and it's easy. There we go. Type that one in. Thank you for the correction, everybody. Is in the next six months is the economy? Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? Ugh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ugh. 
just, it's better. Is the economy going to get better, right? Yes or no? Economy going to get better in the next six months? Yes or no? There you go. I, for some reason, I'm moving too quick. It's the beauty of doing things live. All right. So economy getting better, yes or no? Type in your answer there. And I'm going to run through this economic data here as we wait for those results. I know. I'm a, I got a do-over of a do-over, Gems. Uh, I'm tired. It's been a long day. I apologize. I'm screwing up. <laughs> It is, Thomasina. If you saw my setup here, it's like mission control. I'm trying to do 18 different things at once. All right, so let's go and look at the economic data. So I'm, I'm only focusing on the U.S. I apologize for anybody who um, lives outside the U.S. You can do the same type of analysis on your market. But I'm going to just run through manufacturing data. We'll start with, I'm going to look at every piece of data for the next, for one month, just to give us an idea. And I'll do it quickly. You know, we're talking about economic hurricane. Let's see if we are in fact seeing the hurricane here or other problems. So um, the big ones, manufacturing numbers. Here's a chart of manufacturing. Well, I would say that the hurricane is already brewing, right? Notice that since mid-2021, these manufacturing PMI numbers are declining. And PMI basically means what does a, a, a large selection of purchasing managers in the manufacturing world feel about the economy going forward? So you can already see the pessimism here. Now, it's not negative. We did see it negative in 2016. We saw a real big drop down in 2018. So this isn't the most monumental piece of data, but it is showing some weakness. Um, Jolt's job openings. I'm going to skip that one. Um, we'll look at ADP non-farm employment change, which actually came out today. So we could update that one. But, you know, uh, are we in a catastrophic period? No. We are seeing the number of employment, the employment numbers decline significantly. You can see what came out today. Uh, I thought it would be 200. We actually came out at 128. And I thought it'd be worse than expected. So we're starting to see that trend down. So argument would be in favor, not necessarily of a hurricane, but we're seeing weakening, weakening performance with regards to non-farm employment change. All right, I'm going to keep moving here. Uh, this is probably the biggest piece for the storm, in my opinion, is the FOMC, right? The Fed funds rate. Notice going back here into 2000, we were up over 6%. We're up at 6.5. And then we got glued to zero for a long time, and now we're spiking quickly. If the Fed keeps on track, you know, this is going to start to hurt the economy. Who knows if it's the hurricane piece, but it could certainly um, create some headwinds for the marketplace. Let's see. What else do I got here that's not worried about unemployment claims? Average hourly earnings. This is a very subtle one, right? So average hourly earnings should remain relatively flat. And if you notice here... It is pretty flat. Um, it's still, in my opinion, higher than historical norms. You know, if we if I zoomed out here, you can see that back in 2011, 12, you know, we pretty much stayed right around 0.1. Now we're at 0.3. So I, I think that it's definitely getting, this number is getting better. So people are making more money. However, oh, this doesn't have personal spending on it. All right, so that was one month ago, three weeks ago. Uh, consumer price index numbers. Now, if we look at inflationary data, it looks like it's still rising. Of course, we have this one-time huge drop here. Uh, remember, one-time one data does not mean uh, an indicative change of the overall trend. So I'm going to wait for the next number to roll out, which should be, I believe it's going to happen next week. We'll get the rollout of CPI and PPI numbers and see if they pop up a little bit here. But this was a, obviously a great one for most people in the market because it means inflation is somewhat in check. So uh, I don't see that as being as bad. It looks like inflation is starting to slow a bit, which would be good and maybe uh, circumvent an economic hurricane. Michael Burry says we're in an, already in an economic recession. Look, I don't listen to that guy. He got lucky with the housing bubble. He nailed it, but he's been wrong on a lot of other stuff. Um, I have one friend personally that has been nothing but bearish ever since I've known him since the 90s. And for him, every day is the market crash. And it's like, you know what? When he's right, he'll boast about it and brag about it. And in the case of Michael Burry's uh, case, he'll write a movie about it. But he's been wrong a lot. So I don't put much weight on what Michael Burry says. Let the market talk to me. So we've got inflation. Looks like it's starting to drift back down a little bit. Nothing overly um, uh, exciting, but we still are higher than normal. All right, that doesn't mean economic hurricane. Now I'm going to two weeks ago. Retail sales numbers. Now, it's tough because if I look back at this data here, you know, you looked at 0.6 to 0.1 was kind of the high points. Well, here we are now, and we're back to 0.6. So even though the numbers look lower than his, than we have seen in the past you know, year or so because of COVID, they're still kind of right at historical norms. 
So retail sales, even though they've gone from 2.1% growth month over month to 0.6, 0.6 is roughly average. So I think that this is um, not that scary. It's just what does the trend do, right? We've seen over the past four months a steady decline in retail sales. If we go negative, then that could represent some economic contraction, but I don't see it. I just don't see this being the death spiral yet. So that was retail sales. What else do I got? Um, this is one that I don't think a lot of people are going to be focusing on. I, for one, am, which has been the unbelievable surge in home price purchases. This, of course, is because everyone was getting $1,200 stimulus checks and the Fed was just throwing money left and right, and crush rates down to zero, and we had this huge demand for housing. I mean, I'll zoom way out here. The last time we had a spike this big in demand for housing and existing home sales was back in 2005. Mind you, that was a year or two before the markets collapsed. And you notice a similar picture kind of forming now. Uh, you notice when we peaked back here in 2005, notice it sold off, bounced, and then sold off again. Well, we're right there right now, almost forming the exact pattern as we did from the peak of 2005. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to hit those recessionary lows like 2009, but it is history somewhat repeating itself. Uh, this to me, is probably the single biggest argument other than the Federal Reserve rating, raising rates that I could give you to support an economic hurricane. Because if these numbers start to decline significantly, existing home sales, and things really start to crash, that means you're, you don't have buyers, then I think it, we we are a very difficult, challenging place. So we'll I'll be keeping an eye on this one. To me, this is probably one of the most important pieces for an economic collapse. We'll be looking at housing. And it's starting to slow down. We saw existing home sales plummet. And I'll show you that here in just a second. Um, you also have this one here. Empire State Manufacturing Index just went negative yet again, right? And this is basically the sentiment about manufacturing in the New York area. Well, not good. Things were great up until four months ago, five months ago, and then just, boom, collapsed. Uh, Nick says, different conditions in housing. Yes, absolutely, Nick. I am absolutely not saying, <laughs> I'm definitely not saying that this current housing market is like what we saw in 2006, 7, 8, and then the bubble popping. Not. It's very different. However, you do have a lot of people that are going out there because of this cheap, easy money buying properties, and they may not be able to make payments on those things if the markets start to get a little bit wonky and, and sell off more. All right. So in the next six months, is the economy going to get better? 75% of you said no. 25% of you said yep. Um, and, you know, there is no right or wrong here. Uh, only in six months, we'll know. Personally, I would put myself in the no camp. I don't think it's going to get dramatically worse, right? I don't think that we're just going to be sitting there watching this market die for the six months. I think you're going to see just a slow trickle down as this incredibly overheated machine starts starts to cool off a little bit. So I am definitely not in the camp of saying catastrophic collapse, just I don't see the growth coming. So I think you're just going to get this slow taper down. You know, the angle we have right now in our market, I just lose the S&P 500, you know, that's fairly aggressive. I actually expect personally that this will start to drift, look more like this. Uh, hold on. Let me just go in the time, forward in time here. I think you'll start to see something like this. And notice that the, the, the slope of this decline is much less, right? And, you know, you guys remember, I, I, I went out on a crazy whim and said, we, I think we get back to these 2000, or 2020 lows, which would be insane. Um, but I think it's going to take some time to get there. And I, again, I know I'm the oddball and that's just an out, outlandish call, but it wasn't that long ago and this is all fueled by cheap money, which now is getting pulled off the table. Um, Roland, some people stand by the transportation index or sector for economic strength. What do you say? Um, I do think that that's an important one. I think that looking at transportation is key because if we see a, lot, a, a de heavy demand for transportation and that stock starts to do really well or that economy, uh, market segment does really well, that's a sign of a thriving economy, right? If all of a sudden transportation grinds to a halt and there's nothing moving around and no demand, yeah, that's a sign of there's economic slowdown. So certainly one other piece of information that we could look at um, um, that would help us gauge that. I, I'm going to keep using the economic hurricane piece because I think it's a great a great term that was given to us by Jamie Dimon. Thank you, Mr. Dimon. Um, all right, so nope, we're going to go back to this calendar. And I just want to keep showing more, some more economic data because I think that that's really what we should be basing our opinions off of. So here is last week. And was there, no, uh, here's pending home sales. And I found this interesting because we're seeing a significant contraction, right? We've been down below zero, which means there's been fewer and fewer homes sold. Um, 
over the past six months, we've been negative. I mean, that's a pretty ugly stat there. You look at GDP. This one, I think we have to wait for the next month's reading. If we get the next month's reading negative, then I think the argument for an economic hurricane starts to build because, again, it would give us two consecutive quarters of negative GDP. That happens, mainstream media is going to take that and run with that. I mean, they're going to run with that faster than they could on Pamela Anderson's sex tape. I mean, they're going to be trying to get that thing out there as quickly as possible. First to market, here's why we have a recession and here's what it means. And they need sensationalism. So when we get that print, which will be happening uh, in about three weeks, uh, two, yeah, three weeks, when we get that announcement on GDP, then I think we'll really start to see the uh, the doo doo hit the fan. So if it's negative again, that means that we can start the media can start spreading all this recession talk, and then I believe that economic hurricane could start to pick up a little bit of headwinds. But right now, the data is slowing, but it's not awful. So that was GDP, uh, durable goods orders. For those who don't know, if you ever are curious what these announcements are. It's actually very cool. If you go to somebody like Forex Factory, you can see here it says durable goods orders. And you go, I don't know what durable goods are. Well, you click on that and it'll tell you a little bit about it. It's usually items that have a three-year life expectancy. So you're looking at you know computers, airplanes, appliances, etc. cetera. Um, but look at those durable goods orders. It's not spiking. It's at 0.4. So to, to keep an apples to apples analogy, you see it's 0.4% right now. Let's just scroll back to when times were good. Say, two thousand. Um, let's go 2013, 14, 15, 16. Where were we at? Well, we were considerably higher for most of the time. The average is going to be on durable goods orders, you know, over 1%. So this is definitely not a good sign. I believe a lot of this has to do with the chip shortage, that we're seeing a lot of technology that we would normally buy, those appliances, et cetera, um, vehicles, et cetera, they're using chips, just not making it here. And maybe some of us being a little more frugal in our spending and saying, I'll hold off, uh, given the fact there might be some... Um, some some perils ahead. So durable goods orders is a good one. We looked at GDP. I don't care about unemployment claims. Here's the core PCE price index, which came out last Friday. This, of course, is the one that the Fed has verbally said, this is what we care about. We're still way above normal, um, but it did drift down the previous two months. So that's a good sign from inflation. So uh, let's see. And what do we have starting this week? Because we did have some nice economic data today. Here's what happened this week. So I will start at the top. We'll go consumer confidence, still a relatively high number. 106 is very high. Uh, you look at Jolt's job openings. Uh, da, 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 da. I guess I already looked at average hourly earnings. And then the unemployment rate. All right, this one right here, this does not speak of an economic hurricane at all. This speaks of very good market. This speaks of healthy market. We are, you know, 3.6, um, sorry, 3.5 is the current unemployment rate. Well, again, I'll look back here, going all the way back into 2000, and how far can I go? So I can go all the way back to 2001, November of 2001. We are at historic lows, right? We haven't been this low on unemployment since, it's not even on this chart. Now, of course, that's if you believe those numbers. I believe that the unemployment rate is significantly higher. The rate you're seeing here is called the U3 rate which basically says after a certain amount of time, if people stop looking for jobs, they just fall off the unemployment books. U6 rate would be better, but they're both declining. So let me just here, go here and go uh, U6. Now, th this is actually put out by the BLS. So you can go here. There's the Bureau of Labor Statistics, bls.gov. And if we look at that U6 rate, which is right here, they're saying right now it's 7%, which I think is probably a better representation. So what does, what does the PMI index say? Well, another nice thing here is, again, you can go back and say final services PMI or diff there's different PMI numbers. Let's just see the final services PMI. Um, they do this a big survey. So basically what they're going to do out there is go to 400 different purchasing managers. And it just says, as you can see right here, uh, which asks respondents to rate the relative level of business conditions, including employment, production, new orders, prices, suppliers, deliveries, or supplier deliveries, and inventories. So if this number starts to drop, it's a reflection of pessimism. And you can see right now, anything above 50 still means economic growth. So I think that this is actually relatively still good, right? We're at 55.6. It's above 50. When you get down below 50, that basically means that those 400 managers, or a majority of them, are saying, this doesn't look good. We're not getting deliveries or our unemployment, our employment looks bad. 
and you start to get that pessimism roll in. Now this goes all the way back to 2014 and you can see that really only two times back on the 2016, we had one little blip below 50 and then um, in 2020, right, as the COVID pandemic hit, we had one, two, three, four, five, six months below it but we have not been back since. So I think it's interesting. This one, we're seeing the trend, right? I'm definitely a trend person. It spiked at about 70, and now we're drifting down. And remember, they just started raising rates. And what I tell you, I said that it takes between most likely nine months to a year. Some will say six months. It's going to take nine months to a year for that economic data to hit, which means you've got nine bars left before you – actually, since we started in, in February, um, you know, you've got – let's say six or seven bars left before that rate increase actually starts to impact their bottom line in some of this economic data. So, all right, I'm missing a lot of questions here. Um, doesn't the slope down like that make it difficult to buy puts? E no, no nothing, nothing makes it difficult to buy puts, right? You can buy puts anytime. Obviously, uh, I'm looking to buy puts when I see a market rally up. Right? I would love to buy puts on a day like today because puts are cheap. No one wants the protection. They're not, they're not worried about it. So the premiums just decline significantly and I can buy my puts much cheaper. It's when markets are going down and near the lows that that's when the fear steps in and people want to buy those puts. So a day like today, great day to be buying some puts. I actually thought about adding to my position, but I was in class and I was like, you know what, let me just focus on what I'm supposed to do here. But um, I bought some last week. And there you, today's, today would have been a good one, right? The, the cost of those puts would have been relatively cheap compared to what they were like the day before. So um, a downtrending sloping line net wouldn't necessarily make it hard to buy puts, but maybe the premium wouldn't be as good. It's all about the relief rallies to the upside. Uh, Merlin, did you buy more puts? Nope, I did not. I didn't do anything out there today. Um, yeah, it was, a, it, was, it was in a classroom all day, so unfortunately I didn't get my chance to do that. Uh, GD, Merlin, some people stand. Nope, I already got that one. Karen says, might the Fed manipulate the data just to keep us out of a recession? Yeah, absolutely. Right now, I'm, I'm, I'll bet you they're trying to figure out what they can do to help keep us from a recession. And not necessarily keep us from a recession. I think that might be a false statement. I think the, the true thing would be to modify the data so that we don't panic, right? I think there should be a third mandate, a third mandate for the Fed. Of course, the, the dual mandate is um, keep inflation under control and keep the value of the dollar steady. Third one should be let's not create fear in the marketplace because if fear starts to build, that just destroys everything that the Fed has done and built. If you get panic and markets start to crash, good luck trying to stop it, right, once that fear precipitates. So do they manipulate data? Yes, uh, they absolutely do. Let me see real quick. Merlin, uh, not did my calls, not to manipulate. Do you believe that the unemployment, I do not believe that unemployment number. No, not the U3. I, I think that personally the U6 is probably a closer representation of what it truly is. Um, you know, I'll, I'll never actually know. And I don't even think that our governments actually know. They're just taking samplings of data. But uh, no, I don't, I don't believe, I don't believe any of the data really that I just read to you, but that's all we have to go off of, right? If I'm going to look at economic data to make my, my uh, hypothesis about an economic hurricane data ahead, I need to go through here and look at all this stuff. And, you know, tomorrow, um, tomorrow we get this next unemployment rate number. Based off what we're seeing, you know, you're seeing ADP non-farm employment change drop significantly today. I was actually expecting, as I mentioned, to be 200. I, I thought we would miss. Didn't think we missed that bad, yet the market's rallying. I love that. Um, but the trend has been pretty solid here. You know, I think that there's there's plenty of jobs. So I do believe unemployment rate has been falling. I just don't think it's at 3.5%. Uh, let me see. But Bill Addis says we need a recession to help stop inflation. I agree. I, I think we need a significant market correction to help fight inflation. Right? If we have a huge, and, and, and this sounds bad, but if we have a large market drop, let's say 50% off the all-time all -time highs, if that happens, that kicks into effect a chain of events. You're going to see all of a sudden Walmart and, and your retail stores around town are going to start to lay some employees off because if people are out of work because these numbers are so poor and they're getting laid off, they can't go out and buy stuff like they normally do. So restaurants won't be as full. Your movie theaters won't be as full, right? You'll start to see uh, light attendance there. And then that, in turn, creates this downward spiral. And it will cleanse the system, all of this. But it's going to be very painful. Uh, it could be painful for quite some time. Uh, you know, right now, I, I, I am in the camp of, I think, the, fat, the Fed put themselves into a corner. 
and is now trapped. And I'm not exactly sure how you get out of a situation, let's quote unquote stagflation, which you know is um, high unemployment. We don't have that, so we're not in stagflation now. But I mentioned this before, high unemployment, um, declining GDP, and high inflation would be three variables that would lead us to a stagflation environment. So I'll certainly be anticipating or watching what's going on with the unemployment data because if this starts to turn around and spike back up, then we've got stagflation on our hands. We don't have it now, and we may not for a while. Sears announced 71. <laughs> Sears. Randall Sears has been announcing. I think that's like, it's funny because there was a period of time where like Subway was announcing, hey, we opened this many stores this month. Sears is just the exact opposite. <laughs> Sears is always closing. I mean, does Sears even have any stores anymore? <laughs> I remember as a kid, I used to always walk through the Sears at the mall, but come on, Sears? No. Um, but I think you'll see more companies starting to do layoffs. What else I got here? The Fed, you can't handle the truth. I think that's, I think that's probably true. I think the Fed is kind of saying that. I think that the vast majority of Americans uh, are are living paycheck to paycheck. You know, I was talking to some friends about this the other day. I believe it was Forbes magazine did some poll, and individuals, <laughs> this blows my mind, individuals who are making over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars per year, thirty percent of those are living paycheck to paycheck. You make two fifty a year and you're living paycheck to paycheck. What that tells me is you are a reckless spender, right? Reckless spending. You should be able to survive significantly off a very low paycheck as long as your expenses are controlled, right? Do I have to have the new M3 and super fancy clothes and go get my Infliction T-shirts that are two hundred dollars a piece when I can go get some Hanes beefy tees for five bucks a piece? That's just stupidity. Um, blows my mind that those statistics are out there. Yeah, thirty percent of people making 250 grand a year are living paycheck to paycheck. I cannot imagine. I mean, even when I was, not that I'm holier than thou, but I just always perceived safety in markets. Uh, when I was an early, in my late teens, early 20s, I always had cash in the bank. Always. I was never living paycheck to paycheck. Now, of course, I lived with my parents so I was 18, but when I moved out, I paid my rent, I paid my insurance, all that stuff myself, and I always had money in the bank. Why? Because I know I needed to do that. I know I needed to build. And I think a lot of people, unfortunately, live paycheck to paycheck. It just blows my mind. Naum says 65% of Americans can't come up with five, um, $500. Scary. That, that, that is absolutely frightening. What if something tragic happens? You should all be planning for that and all, you know, make sure you have something to fall back on. And that all comes back to planning, saving, and making sure you put the right investments. They probably bought three houses living paycheck. <laughs> yeah, true. And again, you know, it's a good point you make there. Uh, you know, what happens to that guy or that individual if they bought three houses and that's why they're living paycheck to paycheck, which could very well be, right? And of course, you're thinking that they're rich. But if the markets change and that individual loses their job, they're going to lose all three of those houses, right? So it's all about planning and making sure, I mentioned this when we talked about real estate, make sure that if you're buying something, buying a home, make sure that you can make that payment even if you lose your job for a while, right? And you're not going to be unemployed permanently. Um, heard the same thing. People are living beyond their means. Yep. People like goldfish, they grow to match their income. <laughs> I've never heard that, but it actually makes sense that I'm going to match their income. And I think that's most people. You know, um, you guys have been very good about pushing me to finish writing my book. I'm bored with the first one. I think I have a better chance of finishing my uh, my second book if I really sit down and do it. And it has everything to do with what we're just talking about. The ability to look at your finances, plan your finances, and say, here's how I'm going to grow my wealth and get rich over time. And it all starts with your spending. All right. Anyway, no more rants there. Sorry. I had a couple questions I want to make sure I get to. Oh, by the way, I did fix this. My numbers were off. I apologize for yesterday. I was moving too fast. I corrected this. And these are the correct numbers. And what you have here is what they, the performance numbers were for the month of May. And, and this is slightly different because uh, it did off the futures products. And of course, the futures products have some uh, degradation of results, but it's very close. And then you can see on the right-hand side, I have the range. So I just wanted to make sure that that's updated here um, just to make sure I corrected my mistakes from yesterday. All right. Um, Owen says, Sears was badly hurt during 1919 to 2021 as a severe depression hit the nation's farm. Yep, yep. By 20, Sears regained financial stability. Not only that, but they were actually the staple. I, I think that Sears was where you would go. Sears you know, and Roebuck. Let's throw Roebuck in there. Poor Roebuck. He just got lost in the shuffle. But Sears, 
in, from my perspective, some of you might not agree with this, but I think Sears was like the Walmart in like the 60s and 70s, right? And then Walmart just took over. I think that the, the Sears model was very similar to Walmart, but Walmart just went a little bit bigger and cheaper and crushed Sears. You know, same thing with JP. J, yeah, there you go. Sears was Amazon. I go for that, right? They didn't have grocery stuff at, at Sears like they do at Walmart, but yeah. Um, oh, great. Thanks. I got some spammer. One sec. Let me get this guy out of here. Sorry. I apologize for that. Um, there we go. Sorry. I hate jerks like that. Scammers. Uh, let's see. Quote from Paul Bellamy, a character from Margin Call. You learn to spend what's in your pocket. Yep. Yep. Uh, da -da -da. You could buy a shotgun at Sears. I actually walked through looking to buy a shotgun at Sears. I thought that was kind of cool. All right, let me see if I got other questions here. Um, I wanted to show you a couple things with regards to earnings calendar, and I'm going to run through a couple questions, and then we'll wrap up because I realize I'm late. Uh, we have Hormel Foods, which, as one of you pointed out yesterday, Hurl being a logo. That's that's just a great, um, great ticker symbol. So you notice that they they beat their earnings, right? They beat earnings slightly. They're supposed to make 46 cents. Came out at 48 cents. Beat by two. Down 5% on the day. Here's your chart of Hormel Foods, which uh, might have some of the shareholders hurling on that news. You also had Lululemon. So here's Lulu, right? Lululemon reported earnings. They beat just slightly. Um, still not looking great. You know, it was over 480, went as low as 250. So you're almost a 50% haircut for Lululemon. But let's be honest, Lululemon still in popular demand out there. Now, um, your economic announcements we already looked at today. I'm going to answer this one question here real quick just because... It was sent in from Heath. I want to make sure I get to that one before I wrap up. Uh, Heath asked me, when would you say is a good time to buy crypto? I can't tell you. I don't know. I'm not a financial advisor. I cannot give financial advice. I can tell you what I am doing, and that's very different than what you should be doing. So from my perspective, I still think crypto is going down. I think in the short term, in the next three months to six months, I believe we're going to see further downside uh, depreciation of assets. I think that's that's especially crypto. That said, my time horizon is going to be five to 10 years. So I think there's some great values out there, Heath. One of the students today in class asked me, he said, if you could pick one crypto, what would you buy? It's like, I can't tell you what to buy. You know, I, I think there's a lot of great projects out there. I think there's some stuff that is systemic and needs to be there, like Chainlink. You know, you can't have oracles or you can't have smart contracts or do all the things you do without oracles. So Chainlink's one of the biggest oracles, but so's Rep and several others. So I, I think it's um, I think it's important that you look at the whole spectrum of crypto, see what you want to buy, and then say how long am I going to hold it? If it's something you're going to buy and hold for a month or two, might want to wait. I would hold off, let the market prove it's moving up. I mean, you can look at the chart of Bitcoin here today. It just doesn't look great. You know, we had that nice little bounce. Let me get these stupid moving averages off here. We had that nice little bounce a couple days ago, but it's giving it all back. And here you are, just you know, right back of this area of consolidation. You look at one of my, uh, one of the ones I, I like from the Oracle perspective, which is Chainlink. Here's Chainlink. I mean, this thing is just going sideways, doing nothing. So maybe you do what we would do with any other asset and say, prove to me, Chainlink, that you're going to make a higher high. So I put a line above the high from this area of consolidation, which I'll draw a yellow box around it, omitting that outlier tail. All right. If it gets above that, which is $8, then maybe you buy some. But just let it just just keep going down. <laughs> let, let it drift down until it proves to you that you buy some. And then that's the time that I would say is a good time to buy crypto is when the market starts to make some new highs and proves it's no longer in a downtrend. I just don't think we're out of the woods yet, Heath. So there you go. Uh, let me see what I got multiple questions coming in. Crypto buying anytime you have money to spare. I wouldn't say anytime, Gallo. You know, make sure you got money on the table. I think that's important uh, that you have a backup reserve. But if you have some spare, and again, your timeline is long term, I think you'll do fine over the next few years, but you know you could see two years of just sideways or down action in crypto. That doesn't that's not very appealing to a lot of people. Uh, Margaret says, "Are there more stocks for shorting that are listed as hard to borrow?" So your broker will manage their own risk. So TradeStation, for example, has a short list and it's a hard to borrow list. That list is always changing. It's not necessarily based off the individual security. More likely, it's based off of their inventory. Because remember, what they're doing is they're lending out their personal shares. So let's say every one of us is a client at TradeStation, right? And you all have 1,000 shares of Microsoft. If I want to short Microsoft, well, TradeStation has a lot of Microsoft shares. Because each of you holds some. I'm going to borrow from one of you. You don't know. It's in When you sign your contracts, 
you are literally giving them permission to take your shares and short those. Now, if they don't have a lot of shares on hand, they'll put it on a hard to borrow list or just restrict you altogether. So that, that's how that happens, Margaret. It's based off each individual firm. So the bigger the firm, the more likely they're gonna have assets for you to short. If it's a small little brokerage firm, they don't have a lot of customers, you're probably not gonna have a large inventory of shorting opportunity unless they borrow it from another firm, but normally they can't be bothered with that. Um, what software do you use to back up your computer data? I back up drive, an offsite backup service. Uh, I do it locally. So I will just duplicate my drive and I've got it sitting in another drawer. That's it. Simple. I'm not so worried about my trading backup. Um, I have layouts and stuff like that, but really it's more about the show data, right? If, if my internal hard drive crashes, all my templates, frames, key settings, everything, that goes away on this computer. I'm not so worried about my trading one. Not, the, the data for most of them is held at the, at the trading firm anyway. Um, then why do you buy crypto now believing it still has more downside? Because what if I'm wrong, GD? What if I'm wrong and this is, today's the dead bottom? What if I'm wrong and for the next six years, just nothing would go up and I miss that? Uh, I'm dollar cost averaging, which is really the, the essence of what a 401k is, right? A 401k is a dollar cost averaging vehicle. So as this thing drops and you notice it's already down 50%, I'm looking at it as, hey, this is a good buying opportunity. So look at, look at Chainlink again, for example, just because I had that one up. Um, you know, we'll look at where this has come from. I mean, this is really bad. This thing's been dropping for a while. I think this has a lot to do with competition. Um, let's just go from there to where we are right now. Chainlink is down roughly 86%. Okay, well, you know, it still has room to go down. I see a lot of uh, downside potential here, although we did kind of bounce off this trend line. So from that perspective, I'm okay holding a long term. I just have to be sure that the project is legitimate, right? Like Terra Luna, that one just cratered and fell apart because it was almost almost a Ponzi scheme. And, and I just did not see that one. For most of the projects that I'm investing more money into, they're ones that have some codependence on the entire ecosystem, a symbiotic relationship, if you will, because Chainlink is necessary for things like Ethereum, for Cardano, for Polkadot. It's an external data source. So to me, that's critical. But there's a lot of other. I'm not trying to hammer on uh, uh, Chainlink here, but there's a, quite a few other cryptocurrencies that are uh, significant like that as well. What do you think about Tesla? I love the company. I just I just can't bring myself to buy it. So there's Tesla. We had uh, the 406 mark was my buy point, but did not did not get down there. I still think you are looking at weakness in Tesla overall, and, and that's above and beyond what's going on with Twitter and that old soap opera there. But it looks like it's lower lows, lower highs. So I'd be looking to short rallies here on Tesla because it's now making a downtrend. Has been since October of last year. So slowly drift down. A dollar cost average when I trade and it works for me. The danger there now, I've mentioned this one before, investing and trading have completely different risk profiles. So as a long-term investor who's got a five, how did this guy get back in again? Get out of here, you jerk. God, unbelievable. Um, if you're dollar cost averaging on a long-term, you have the benefit of time and price fluctuations. If you're dollar cost averaging on trades, that's really dangerous because you don't have the benefit of time. And if it continues to drop and continue to drop, you could get margin called out. So for me, dangerous to be adding to losing positions, which is dollar cost averaging, um, as a short-term trader. Somebody's trading for a couple of days, or intraday, or maybe in like a week or so. But as a long-term investor with a five to 10 year time horizon, not worried about it. You know, the different, uh, different, I guess, trade-offs for different asset classes. <laughs> well, he's blocked on here now. He won't be able to come back. He, he, he changed his name somehow just slightly, Margaret. That's how he got back in. But I block him right away. He Yeah, I block him. Uh, Joe, I love how people keep posting about buying stocks and crypto regularly all the way down to the bottom and showing data that uh, says it's the best strategies. That should be penalized. Well, you know, look, 401ks, that's how they've, they've proven themselves is over time, They'll go up, which is true because, you know, 401ks are equity markets. So dollar cost averaging in that environment will be good. My, my big worry is if a market drops 50%, you know, how much money you can have left or like it did in 2000 and 2008, how long you have to wait for it to get back to break even. I would rather be more active, but with crypto, I'm definitely just uh, the buy and hold cap. All right. Uh, I am going to, yeah, he's partying for one hour, but I realized that it's not going to happen. So I got to run back to the studio right now and shoot some stuff anyway. So I got to get out of here. Here is what's happening for 
Tomorrow, the earnings calendar, there's really nothing important for tomorrow, but there is some important data coming out tomorrow as we already looked at this. You can see if you're trading the euro, you got a lot of news coming out for the euro tomorrow, a lot of which dealing with uh, services, etc. Uh, unemployment rate comes out. That is probably the bigger news for tomorrow. That is going to happen, uh, unemployment is at one hour before the markets open. These are all Eastern Standard Times. Uh, that euro has been on a really aggressive downtrend as well. So I'm kind of uh, curious to see if the um, economic data coming out of Europe influences that at all. For the U.S., you've got non-farm employment change, average hourly earnings, unemployment rate, final services PMI, uh, ISM services PMI. And then this is one that might be really interesting is at, at 7.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, FOMC member Brainerd will be speaking, and, and I, I'm, I'm curious what she has to say. She's been very vocal about the markets and inflation and even talking about digital assets, so I'm curious to see what her comments are. But anyway, that's your economic announcement stuff for tomorrow. Um, I will have a glass of whiskey. It's Frey Ranch. That's right, out of Nevada. Frey. I will remember that one because I'll go grab a bottle today if I can get over there today. I'll get trivia tonight. Um, cool. Thank you very much for, for bringing that one. And Nevada whiskey called Smoke Wagons, even better. I'll try that. Uh, anyway, Ron, thank you so much for the contribution. I appreciate it. For those of you that uh, are new to the program, click that subscribe button. That helps me out. You can also you know, like the show if you like it. If you don't like it, you can always email me and tell me what's wrong with it or what I can do to improve it. You can also put your comments down below the YouTube videos. That helps the channel, and I will get to your questions on tomorrow's show. It will be Friday, which means I will have a nice frosty cold beverage here, most likely with a whiskey ice cube in it. Hope you guys have a great trading day on Friday. I'll see you tomorrow. Take care.